Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Everybody, hump day. Oh, hey gang, how is everybody doing out there in the chat today? I see weather reports, but I'm also seeing an allusion to a sports report. Oh, um, Eric's mentioning the uh, Germany Japan. Football match. Football. I don't know how that ended. Um, Canada rolls uh, two o'clock Eastern this afternoon, uh, out against Belgium, first game. So I'll be keeping an ear, probably in that direction. Ear so or an be... eye or something. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah, it is. Mm. Uh, it's cold in Arizona, but I can't really say that without people laughing at me. So go ahead, and laugh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How cold is it? <laughs> well, let's see. I'm going to switch over to Celsius so my Canadian <laughs> friends can can understand my lingo. <laughs> mm-hmm. We um, here in eastern Ontario, it's it's hovering around the freezing mark, and it has been doing that for a week. Um, we had about two or three weeks of like. 20 celsius upper teens celsius in november which is just crazy and then last week it got cold it snowed and most of the snow has melted but it feels like an early winter so far it's eight degrees eight degrees well that is that's cool for arizona for sure yeah um that's only like chilly that's only eight degrees warmer than here so yeah yeah it's not good not good at all the high will be 22 celsius though so i got that to look forward to that's pleasant. That's not, and that's better than that's better than your usual thirty-five or forty or your potential. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. Yeah. But hey, we got a guest today. Yeah, we should probably talk to. Hey, Chris, who's hanging out with us? Yeah. Hey, gang. We had Aaron Silver's joining us. Aaron, how's yes. the wet weather in Philly today? Uh, I don't know the Celsius uh, equivalent, and I'm not doing the math this early. I don't <laughs> even have coffee with me, so it's really we're really. <sighs> oh, I know, I know, I know. We're 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 it, it we're. We're, we're basically just going raw today, but uh, <laughs> it's like uh, 46 right now in Fahrenheit, uh, which is probably around 20-ish or so Celsius. It's probably closer to 8 or 10, much more like, uh, much more like Brent. Where I'm at. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, that's where we're at. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, if I switch I myself know. back yeah. to Fahrenheit, <laughs> I think it'll probably say about the 40 ishes or something let's see what we got here yeah 47 47 and 8 so 8 celsius is 47 fahrenheit there we go there you go all righty very cool um aaron you have been with us before but there may be folks uh, joining us today who haven't met you yet uh introduce yourself to our gang here today Sure, everybody. Hi, I'm Aaron Silvers. Uh, I am a learning scientist and architect uh i've been uh mostly what i do is work with teams uh large and small on uh basically like building out like how you develop your basically like ability your capability to make data-driven decisions uh to do that and i have been working in online uh, learning standards for like two decades uh i I gig to the federal government. I gig to IEEE and international standards. Uh, I full-time gig at Elsevier, and I do precision learning uh, products for them, architecting and learning science. Because that's why I'm a learning scientist and architect. And um, uh, and when I'm not doing any of those things, I'm playing bass. I play guitar, and uh, I run big fireworks uh, shows uh, here in Narberth, uh, Pennsylvania, because. Uh, that's what I do. I just blow shit up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that's a 
Yeah, well, there's a lot to unpack in that part. Uh, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> potentially. Can you um, believe that people trust me to buy fireworks for a town? <laughs> uh, I, all I want to know is, can you can you connect XAPI data tracking to those shows somehow? I've modeled. I've modeled the data for that already. I haven't, you know, put it into the launchers and stuff like that. But you know. I'm going to try and work on it for like another contract or two. See if I can get it funded to do that. <laughs> nice. Very cool. And XAPI is our official topic here today. Um, Aaron, I don't think you explained to the folks your connection though, specifically to XAPI um, and your, your role <sighs> in its arrival. Okay. So let's, let's fill them in a little bit on that, just so they know where you're coming from on this particular topic. Okay. Are we going to the Wayback Machine? Yeah, let's do the Wayback Ooh. Machine. All right. So, uh, 2010, uh, 2009, um, I started uh, reconnecting with folks that I worked with when I was working for ADL Advanced Distributed Learning. Um, previously, um, I, at the time, I was working at Granger. I was like a, like a head peon for internal research and development for learning workforce. Is that when you and I met? When you were at Granger? I think yeah. it was. Wow. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I was just like actually, all of a sudden flashback. Been, <laughs> might have been before then. Might, we might have actually met before then, Brent, but it was right around that time when I was like starting to participate in DevLearn and stuff like that. So, okay, okay. Um, at any rate, um, collaborating with folks that helped that work that I worked with to do SCORM 2004, and when I when I was involved in SCORM 2004, um, I was doing. Uh, I was in charge of creating and designing uh, and developing all the content examples. So all the piece of content that you could download from ADL that demonstrated SCORM 2004, the, co the data model, the sequencing and navigation, how it worked with, how you could get Flash Director to work with SCORM to send stuff back and forth. Right. You can blame me for Articulate and uh, all your other crappy authoring tools that did converted from Flash. Yeah, see, I said authoring tools. Convert from Flash into, you know, just making stuff into SCORM. I got paid to do a job. I did the job well. There you it go. It all worked. You're welcome. Anyway, <laughs> XAPI was, was, we started working on this thing called an experience API. And the idea there was that SCORM did a lot of things, but it was also rooted in like the best of like 1990s thinking as cemented by 2000s thinking around like how uh, everything's a silo. Well, as we've learned in the 2000s, like nothing was a silo anymore. Everything says permeable borders. So we needed to think about just the architecture around what we were trying to do with online learning very differently because the assumptions in a modern technology landscape were very different than they were in 1990s and 2000s so um we started working on like basically like what a service architecture would look like you know how, how would you have an api to do this stuff what would the data load have to be like all of that weird stuff which i was learning people i was a former classroom teacher i never had to deal with that stuff before so a lot of it was learning how to computer science while the computer science was evolving and happening and doing it from a learning frame not from a technology frame so was, we had a lot of challenges to overcome all that said um 2010 i presented uh i led a team to present these ideas to the center for national research initiatives in the u.s it's uh, basically like the public arm of darpa uh and they thought I was insane, but not so insane that it wouldn't work. And four months later, we were inside of ADL doing it. And a year after that, uh, well, a couple of years after that, 2013, 2012, we started the initiative. 2013, we released XAPI 1.0. Uh, and now uh, it has just gone out in as a stand, as a IEEE's first open source standard. Very cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I remember when uh, that official paperwork was getting all ironed in and, and getting done. But now all of that's done. It's official. It's, it's in the books for, with IEEE and it good to go. In the books. Shipped, cool. as they say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. So IEEE, do, if somebody wanted to go see that, 
they'd go to I triple E what dot org or uh I will that. find a link to the definitive spec and send and pass it on to you. But yeah, you basically you know, it's through like what the LTSC is the Learning Technology Standards Consortium. It's the part of the IEEE. It's the group inside the IEEE that deals with all the learning technology specs and standards. Gotcha. So. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. And I think that was uh, as as Tin Can was getting close to. That's when I first met you, which would um, mm-hmm. be about a decade ago now. Um, and yeah. we're just thinking like, like the official release of XAPI is nine years ago now, almost about to be, you know, 10 since we're getting so close to that flip of the calendar. Um, yeah. and, and it's really still surprising, though, for me, when we're talking to folks, um, you know, not surprising that SCORM is still such an important thing in, in what most organizations do, but still surprising um, how how little in a lot of cases. Um, let me. I want to phrase this delicately. It's it's still okay. un- unfortunately very common to talk to people who have only heard the phrase XAPI or something, um, and haven't you know learned much about it, haven't seen you know haven't gone beyond other than hearing maybe the phrase and not knowing much about it. Um, because for me, it's such a powerful thing. Um, you know, it it takes it can take our learning content to such a, a an extra level, more data, more information to draw. Um, you know, conclusions uh, from, et cetera. Um, but we certainly still are um, an industry that's very focused on SCORM itself. Um, so let's maybe talk about some of the things that, that XAPI sure. solves for people that, that SCORM doesn't. Well, so I wanna, I'm gonna say, Chris, that uh, my thinking is evolving a bit since, you know, over the last 10 years, because we've been doing this for 10 years, and I'm starting to see yeah. the patterns in which uh, XAPI works really well for folks uh, mm. in where people struggle. And I think until you have like a workplace or like a workforce development initiative, like something meaty, something that's going to require, you know, different basically ways to engage people in both the learning frame and a doing frame, right? Um, it's difficult to wrap people's heads around what problems XAPI is going to solve and that SCORM doesn't solve because for most people, they're limited by the tools they have available to them. And if you have an LMS and that's your sole way that you can get, do any kind of reports and you have a finite you know, approach to how, what kind of content you can even author, um, you're then limited in what kind of ways you can engage people to do things. And so, you know, I'm trying to be a little bit more cognizant of that of the differences in those use cases and the differences in the maturity of organizations where those use cases exist right yeah. like if you're dealing in a in an organization that treats learning as still kind of like its own thing never integrated in with anything else well then you're never going to find anybody who values the data that you could create um and unless you are savvy enough to understand you know the ways to navigate the politics to get to who your business intelligence people are and have a business intelligence problem that you can solve, that you can start to approach with learning, right? Not solve it with learning, but approach it with learning so that you have that provides a data track in triangulating a, like an actual performance gap, right? Um, until you get to then, XAPI doesn't make a whole lot of sense for anything but little, maybe some little one-off things like you want to do the survey or you want to do, you want to track this one extra thing that they do, you know, around like the survey or the evaluation they do afterwards. Like you're trying to close, you're trying to find out more about the learning experience. And I guess that's the lens I would like us to go in is talking mm-hmm. about ways in which we can use XAPI as instructional designers and whatever authoring tools you're using to like get a little bit more information out of what it is that's going on. And a, a really quick way to do that, or not a quick way, but a low stakes way of doing that is to define identifiers for the learning objectives or the competencies that you're trying to teach to or train to or evaluate and start embedding that into the interactions that are relevant to those those skills, those competencies, whatever, and start trying to generate some reports 
around those competencies and what you're finding to do it. Because, for example, we do a lot of your typical online course out of any typical authoring tool that's published with SCORM, for example, you're going to be able to figure out how long they've been in that content in a given session. You could find out how many time, how many sessions they've been in that content. You could find out what score they got out of each session. Those are things you can kind of pretty much expect all the time mm -hmm. as a baseline of stuff. So to flesh that out a little bit more, maybe start trying to figure out how we can, you know, track what the actual CMI interactions are, those like assessment questions that we're asking. And if we're not asking outright assessment questions, then maybe the content itself is a performance assessment of some kind, you know, like a stealth assessment, um, where like you're simulating the job to be done and you're interrogating different process steps along the way to do it. Those are easy ways of things that you could do right now, tomorrow, make a list of identifiers, start tagging things in your content that, you know, speak or teach to those identifiers and just start reporting on what's going on with the, you know, in relation to those very specific things. So it's looking different from uh, looking at, it's starting to get you closer towards teaching to outcomes versus the, teaching to the outcome of the learning experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a, I was on a call this morning, um, one of our user meetup groups and uh, one of our, one of the client teams is um, in, in looking to use XAPI at least to amplify um, a more granular level completion information, you know, to supplement SCORM. So right. the, the course is still in the SCORM package, it's still running, but they want to have more granular information about what you know people completing portions let's call it you know of something um versus the you know the more simple overall course completion and a score for instance and and i think i think that's you know i obviously uh, i'm i'm at a place where i my needs are much, are very enterprisey and scaling and workforce but um the idea of using an XAPI uh, to augment what you're already doing as a requirement, all right, to so that you as a designer, you as a content owner or stakeholder have some more idea about a better insight as to mm -hmm. how that content's being used or how effective it is, um, or the if the flow that you're pursuing is you know meeting the goals, the design goals that you have for how people are interacting with it. Um, I think that's a really good use and like starting use cases for instructional designers to use XAPI because it's solving an actual problem that they mm -hmm. have. It doesn't re necessarily rely on anybody else to do it. It's not necessarily breaking anything that anybody downstream needs in order to do it. Yeah. Um, and it's building up the chops to build up that confidence of like, oh, I, I researched something, I, I got data from it, I got insights from it, I made changes. You complete a loop, it gets you ready to do a harder loop. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it, to me, it was a, it, it, what struck me was that same thing, that it's a great way to start into and, and start leveraging XAPI. Because the more you, you know, take advantage of it, the more value you see, the more, you know, the more you'll see it as a tool in your toolkit for solving other problems than you know when they come up and, and recognizing and as you say it's a good learning experience it gets you started and uh gives you the the chops to then be ready for the bigger thing <laughs> when it's when it's uh when it might show up whenever so. whenever that time comes if it yeah. Ever comes. yeah 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 and and uh, you know when i was describing earlier the that you know everybody's still so many groups are still doing scorm and hardly heard of xapi that's a reflection often you know of organizational awareness of of, of what and, and and reflection of organizational valuing of, of you know what a training program is and there's lots of complexities involved in that not not sure. merely that we're, we're a bunch of um old fogies who can't go you know try something new or, or whatever it's the uh no i mean there's so lots of parts what, of this that are out what, of our control one mm -hmm. of the challenges that so one of the research things that i did uh over the past couple of years for the government was like understanding what do people involved in acquisition need to know about xapi so that when you, you're doing acquisitions 
you're getting better vendors, better choices coming to the table because if you only have people who are used to going after the old learning tools, well, you're going to keep getting Saba LMSs coming to the table. You're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get more modern architectures showing up. You're not, degrees not going to show up for an RFP that doesn't meet things that degree can go do, right? It, the same is holding true all for everything else. So part of it is like, you know, one of the things so I, I just did a presentation on ethical prioritizing, how to prioritize ethical use of learning data. And one of the things that is real, that, that's really clear across like all the, the writing that's been done on that topic is that educating data literacy skills to every state, every stakeholder involved, <coughs> excuse me, is critically important to the success of these things because like you're in a large organization, even in a small organization, the person who knows what they need is not usually the person who's buying the things that they need. That is separated out, and that person usually has no insight as to what's going to happen. So you're almost like describing everything, putting it into a black box, and hoping for the best every single time you need something in an organization. So the more we can upskill people who work on acquisition to understand the risks and costs that can be associated with data not being right. <laughs> um, the needs to be able to make those kind of changes on the fly, like them understanding the context for why people are making requests that they're making in RFPs is really, really important. And it's a really, really important lesson for learning, not just in a, we need to make sure that people know stuff, but also in the, this is how learning people can do their jobs better is by upskilling their partners in an organization that they're dependent on for the acquiring the tools and services that they need. <laughs> you got to be able to self-advocate. Oh, Q, dropping the, the dad <laughs> jokes in the chat there. Uh, Ketsukoa says, uh, it, it's, it's all about getting them to excel at data. Oh, I saw that. I saw that. It's a good one. It's a really good one. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, you got to scroll back up to catch all of them. I've been totally distracted. So, (laughs) (laughs) have we talked about the LRS thing yet? And helping people understand that they need one of those, or did I miss that part of the conversation in my distraction? Y'all are not going to like my my thoughts on this, but I'll say them anyway. Let's let's go ahead so, and go there. Start with the basics for folks who for folks who may so think, be uncertain. If you're getting if you're getting started with XAPI, that data needs to go somewhere. All right. The easiest thing that y'all can do uh, in terms of a turnkey solution is to go out and get an LRS so that that data can just go into a system that knows what it's what you're sending it and knows what to do with it. Okay. What you're going to find though is that 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 gets you pretty far. That can, that can last forever. When I start getting into enterprise use cases, all right, I now have content that's creating data, all right? In order for me to actually operate on any of that data, I have to get it all out of the LRS first. So from my, and into a different data store where I can manipulate the data. So I'm now at a standpoint of like, at what point can I just get rid of the LRS and just send things directly to just a data lake or a data warehouse and slap my analytics engine over it and just do that? Yeah. So that's that's something that I'm starting to experiment with in terms of how difficult or easy that might be. That's a side project I have going on right now. Okay. But um, I do think that from, from an instructional designer's perspective, like it's getting an LRS um, – you know, on the acquisition list may be difficult. Getting, playing around with Swarm Cloud might be really easy, right? Either way, right. you need an LR, you probably need an LRS to get going with SAPI. It's a, in terms of a, a turnkey shortcut to get things, get data being generated and get data being stored somewhere where you can maybe look at it and report on it, right? 
Um, yeah. Yeah. It's one thing to get the data. It's a whole nother thing to, to be able to look at the data in a way that makes sense and matters right. and can be applied in the business sense of it. Right. So from a learning context, like in a straight up learning perspective, as long as learning is siloed or right, in an organization, probably makes sense to have an LRS that gives you some reporting features with it so that yeah. you're just, you know, eliminating the need for as many other tools as possible to get you going. But the reality I run into is that clients, let alone internal stakeholders, want to suck this data and view it in like Tableau or Easy BI or whatever else. Um, every organization seems to be just accepting that data is always a mess. Uh, and we, I think, have tended to overthink the, you know, the semantic interoperability of data more than most other groups are approaching it, I think. Um, well, except for like medical and stuff, they care a lot. Um, medical and, and financial tag their stuff with really hardcore standards around it. But we're not slacking. Like we're learning uh, is, is doing a pretty good job of shoring up our standards and stuff like that. And the tools that are available now that are built on these standards, like things that are built on XAPI profiles now that I could download for open source, pretty amazing once i get through figuring out how to deal with permissions in my environments and stuff like that stuff just works it's really great like yeah. uh i used a uh, yet analytics data sim uh it was an open source project to basically like you give it an xapi profile and some descriptors of virtual agents and now all of a sudden you're like generating data based on parameters that you've given this thing and it will generate hundreds and thousands of statements right so if i'm trying to understand how to make use of uh, all of these new cool analytics tools that are all open source and you know from azure and you know whatnot hey that's cool now i can feed it with tons and tons of data that i actually understand what it looks like so i can actually understand how these analytic tools work <laughs> So I'm trying to keep applying now what I have learned and gained and been able to control from the learning context and now taking it directly into the tech context, like without, without middle people so that I can then hopefully start putting out new blog posts and videos and just like generally build the knowledge base of our of practitioners so that we get more people who are able to not just do make the data but uh, analyze it that's the big mm -hmm. that's i think the big the big stretch right now yeah. very cool um michael asked in the chat um data integrity is scary how do we know if uh if we're working with garbage in garbage out before it's too late well you one you got to model it two you got to get a lot of eyes on it mm -hmm. um and three you know you got to trust your gut like a lot um like, uh, so for example, I'm doing, uh, I have a precision learning application transition to practice through Elsevier. Um, we, uh, us, we provide professional skill, uh, simulation scenarios, um, where we are like presenting newly graduated nurses with like, a, here's a patient scenario that you're going to deal with. Um, and there's a number of different ways in which you can respond. Some of them are good, some of them are outright wrong, and some of them are somewhat mis misleading, right? And what we're trying to do is suss out, one, get you to doing more of the right things more often, and then two, being able to kind of um, recognize some of the biases that you may have that may mislead you into thinking that another approach might be correct so that we can kind of get, get on track with like how to actually, you know, normalize how we approach talking and interacting with patients what meanwhile building up your confidence and your skill set and being able to navigate these scenarios in real life um and the goal of that from a precision learning perspective is to reduce retention right we're or, in, or increase retention i should say we 35 percent of all brand new nurses you know quit the profession within two years um that's like hardcore research established fact, right? Um, 
So what we're trying to do is reduce that loss by, you know, because the research tells us that nurses leave when they don't feel confident in their professional skills and when they don't feel supported by their teammates. And so we built a learning app that focuses on, you know, those two areas specifically, increasing professional skill and making sure that these nurses, these new nurses have a way to communicate with, you know, their team in ways that surface their concerns, said and maybe sometimes unsaid, so that preceptors, nursing managers, nursing educators, just, you know, a leadership team could step in and intervene before someone before someone has had the last straw, you know? Yeah. And to that end, we get, I have a couple of clients who are giving us their, who are sharing some of their retention data with us so that we can kind of evaluate how we're, do, how we're doing as a product. And we're finding, at least with some clients, like they're able to give us improvements in retention cohort over cohort. So like, it's not all us, but we're some of it. <laughs> and being able to have a real business dot to close with summary things and tagging data to you know help us under pinpoint where things might be difficult is an investment that we made early on we haven't even extent we haven't even really capitalized on the full the full the full of it um it's much better now um like we're we're set up in a place now like over the next couple of years where we can start to do look at other we can put in other interventions, other engagements, right? Professional, you know, a, a, a personal observation that's tagged, you know, to the very same skills that we're doing things, just so we had a sense of like, here's someone who knows the stuff saying they saw the person do the thing. And that data is aligned in <clears throat> similar ways that we can cross reference with other things we've been, been tracking in terms of their engagement. And you know, we can do this iteratively and drill down even further and refine. And like we're for, so, I am happy to say that I am now presiding not just over the initial garbage in, garbage out thing, but we've actually already done a whole like changeover of how we tag our competencies uh, in this next you know release that we're putting out in January, and so. We're managing the change in competencies. We have to manage the change on the reporting because now we're going to be looking for different things in the data, right? right. Uh, I still have to build out the legacy stuff so that we can get you back to, if you're looking at old data, you get the old report that tells you what it looked like in the old way. But like, we're dealing now with the maturation of these things and start, I'm starting to learn some better practices about how to get through, get people through that stuff too. So it's not all, so, I get the early question of, you know, what about how do we deal with garbage in, garbage out? The good news is that, like, hopefully you make a lot of good decisions so you don't have as much garbage in <laughs> to begin with. And two, I'm hopeful that uh, with time and practice and a little bit of pain, uh, you know, self inflicted, uh, I'll have some stories to share of how to do that stuff better to set up for the for future changes better. So mm -hmm. we're getting there. Yeah. And maybe the, the first thing is, it, you know, part of your planning process, you have to decide what it is, you know, that you're looking to capture that demonstrates the data or, or provides the information, you know, that relates to what you're actually doing. So it, it comes back to adding that extra layer, um, you know, in, in terms of instructional design, what it is, it, what is it that we, that we want to make, you know, an observation on, and therefore, how do we want to capture that? Um, as opposed to just, uh, firing off statements and seeing, you know, coming back later and try to make a, a sense of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, I always go back to telling folks whenever these new tech and new things and, and whenever you're making any sort of shift inside your organization, inside your training team and whatnot to right, pick some low hanging fruit and run your tests on some of that easy stuff first and get a, get a, get a proof of concept going and maybe, you know, pitch that somehow. But with XCPI, it's a little bit harder to do it that way because you do have to make sure you get an LRS and you get, you know, and you, you, my, you plug my, in all so the right like, stuff. So, so my thing is my take on that is, is like, if you don't have to buy anything, all right, sure. Go for small, 
start small. Okay. If you're going to end up having to buy stuff, solve a big problem. (laughs) It's actually easier than solving a small problem because a big problem, everybody can understand what the problem is. They may have different things that they think are important about it, but everybody sees a big, nasty problem for what it is. All right. That's a Solving great point. Big, and every problem and the big problem and you have everybody to buy has stuff a stuff anyway. They have a stake in it. Stuff anyway, yeah. You may as mm. well go bet big because betting small gets you nowhere. Then you'll have done all this work to have a proof of concept that everyone's like, great. All this now work what? and all this money and what now? You know? That's why I'm like, good go point. after a big thing. Good, go good after point. a big go after the biggest thing. Go after the nastiest, hairiest problem. Go after the problem that nobody else wants to touch. All right. Those are the it. problems I go after. And I have to admit that while I deal with a lot of stress and sometimes it's painful, career wise, success wise, that's worked out really well for me. So, yeah. uh, you know, I have Good to point. say that, like, point. shying away from the hard stuff is not, is not an approach I would advise, but I'm also really weird. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I support you. I support you 100. percent I, I love that. Mm-hmm. If you got a question in the question panel, Chris, you, should we should we jump in there before we? Well, run I wanted to. Time? I just wanted to observe our poll so far that you okay. know we're we're running close to 80. percent So 78.8 percent of the folks uh, responding to the question, "Are you currently using XAPI?" Uh, are saying no. Um, so, you know, it's still, I think that reflects what we're talking about here, that it's still something that lots of organizations are still trying, you know, haven't even begun touching, et cetera. The reason I framed that, though, was that there are two questions in the chat, which both kind of have um, parallels anyway. Basically, um, you know, how much do you need to know about XAPI as an instructional designer to take advantage of it? And or, you know, how do you learn more um, about it? So... Let me, let me try and answer these questions because they're similar <laughs> but different. Um, to Amy's question, like, are there levels of understanding XAPI that pertains to IDs? Um, I think to get started, you don't need to know everything, all right? Um, you need to you need to understand, um, obviously, how to do like how to make a statement and where that statement goes from an under the hood perspective. But mostly it's about at that point, like, what is the thing that I want to pay attention to? And why do I want to pay attention to it? You know, um, Chris, you, you, you talked earlier about how, you know, we got to start kind of with like understanding what it is that you want to track. And I would say you actually need to start with what questions you want to answer. Like before you even start figuring out what it is important to track to support that. You actually need to make sure that you have a question that's one answerable <laughs> <laughs> with data, and then two that you have a, that you have some ideas of like what that would look like, you know, in from a like at the end of the day, all these things will bubble up to, an, to help me answer this question. What are the things that need to be there to bubble up? A lot of so that I can get the answer to this question. Um, so like, for example, um, let me think, of, let me think, of, try to think of some, some use cases or some examples that I, I run into where I'm like, well, we could do that, but we gotta do this. Um, you know, so like, uh, one question that we get is like, you know, um, what's the typical user experience? What's the typical user flow through a course? And um, that's not really so much a learning question as it is like a content owner question, right? Or a content stakeholder question or a product owner question, you know? Um, it's a thing that we can achieve through learning analytics, through XAPI, and it's things that we can that it certainly will tell us a lot about the learning experience, but it's not necessary. That by itself doesn't really get us to something learning, you know? Um, So it's important to think about like, that's a question that we might ask, but what is, but from a, 
what does that mean to an end user? What does that mean to the learner? What does that mean to an instructor? It's going to be very different than what that means to me as a content owner or what that means to me as a instructional designer. So the way in which you'll do that might be very all the same, but you'll draw different stories out of doing that one same data thing. Okay. Uh, a thing I get asked that, that we get asked for a bit um, is wanting to understand uh, like uh, a person's like attendance, uh, you know, and their time on in the session uh, as opposed compared to like how they're scoring. Um, and obviously most everybody who's an instructional designer on this call knows that there's usually no, there can be, there's can often be no relationship whatsoever between how somebody scores in the thing and how long somebody spends on it and how many sessions they take on it, right? Any number of things can be happening. So the idea used for XAPI then is to figure out what it is they're doing specifically inside the course when they're in the session. So then you can then start to determine maybe are they poking in answers just to try and get stuff done? Are they honestly learning and stuff like that? Um, and so like a lot of it is, you know, what are, what are the models that we are expecting that certain scenarios kind of are painted by our data and what does that look like? You know, um, like for example, like if there's a distri even distribution of the amount of time that everybody spends on each assessment item, chances are they're honestly trying to work on the assessment items mm -hmm. you know if you're if it's like you know if you're seeing you know random you know for whatever reasons people want to look at this stuff like you know and again you have to want to look at the data to start seeking out these insights you know yeah. to do this but it's like you have to almost imagine the ways in which you might want to use the data beyond the thing that you're trying to solve so that you could start to really understand what the mo right model for the data needs to be. Because what you want is not just, you don't want to just only answer the one question that you've identified and that's it. You want to unlock lots of other potential questions that you can answer in everything that you do. It's not that you want to track more than the things that you need. It's how you express what you're tracking in ways that can be useful beyond the one thing you're trying to do. Yeah, it takes us full circle back to how you originally started it. Once you know the question uh, that you want to have answered, in some cases and in some organizations, SCORM might be all you need to answer the questions that they want answered. And so maybe <laughs> you just go, I mean, yeah, chances are slim, yeah, but, no, I, you know, but it's, I, but I, that, still deal, I still deal with this myself. And it's yeah. So, forever. so then, then you just, then you don't even go down the X API road. But if what you right. discover is, yeah, they're asking for some information and some, some questions to be answered that SCORM cannot answer, you have to bring up XAPI because you then will be able to have conversations with them about, yeah, we can get that, but here's how we get there. And it's not going to be in the, in the traditional way. And um, so I just, I just kind of wanted to put a nice big bow around that before we wrap up here. But just before we go, just to answer that last question, mm -hmm. what specific <laughs> steps would you take uh, to apply for next, learning experience that I develop? Like how would somebody learn more about XAPI as we, uh, as we start to wrap up? There is no substitute for just doing it and getting it wrong over and over again until you get it right. <laughs> the reality is, is like, so like, for example, you know, like learnxapi.com has uh, courses now that will get you to like uh, beyond starting. Right. Yep. That's, that's it's what not going to get you to a point where you could be me, all right? <laughs> but it's going to get you to a point where you could be you, all right? <laughs> like, like that taking that course does not get you into like, all right, I am now enterprise architect for data, <laughs> and I know all the things you can do, all the things I can't even do that. Yep. Um, and there's been a mention or two in the uh, in the chat too about the XAPI cohorts, which is another great way to just learn by you know maybe you don't have a real problem you're solving, but join a team. See, uh, you see don't have real problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, we it's love cool. it. We love it. Well, we're gonna be wrapping it up here. That's the theme music coming at you. 
And yep. uh, thank you so much, Aaron, for hanging out today. Such great information. Totally yeah. appreciate it. If there's any uh, any data points that you want to share where people can find you, okay, maybe that's a bit of a reach for a bad dad joke. <laughs> uh, drop, <laughs> drop, your, drop your things in the chat there. Folks, I would be remiss if I did not remind you that uh, Domino Learning Systems, makers of Domino One, um, are sponsors of uh, everything we do here on Instructional Designers and in Offices, drinking coffee. Um, so if that's of interest, we're very strong supporters of XAPI. We've been along with it since uh, since the tin can phrasing and, and uh, we actually, um, we've supported it since I think the tin can point nine release anyway, even before the official XAPI rolled Indeed. out. So check it out. Maybe All right. it's value and helpful, valuable and helpful. Gang, thanks so much. Awesome as always, time in the chat. Let's dance on out. Dance on out. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Adios, everybody. <laughs>